everyone. Welcome back to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. And boy, is it warm in the studio boy, today. Oh, uh, <laughs> boy. Mark, ha- I, I, okay, I can't blame Mark. No. From what I understand, <laughs> the science, uh, is that Mark does not have the heat turned up. In no. fact, when we record, there is just no fan and we are in a high level of a building. Yeah. That bakes in the sun all day because it has all yeah. these beautiful windows. And we get to see across the beautiful Halifax Harbor. It's exactly. a great studio. However, yeah, when we can't have the AC on because the fan interrupts the yeah. noise. Well, the noise is interrupting. Uh, it's it's sweaty. It's warm. I Yesterday, well, everyone should go follow BMV Fits yes. at BMV Fits on, on Instagram. Where and we are now posting our fashion. Yes, that's <laughs> BNV. F-I-T-S. Yes. B&B Fit. Uh, <laughs> it is very reminiscent, some might say, of the kind of NBA fashion moments pregame. Yeah, like when they're walking down the tunnel yeah, to so, the locker rooms. And lucky for us, at this lovely studio, we have our own tunnel. Yeah. Um, and so Mark, No longer just used for mini putt. It is now used for fashion moments. Exactly. <laughs> so go follow me and b Fits. Yeah. It's, but yesterday we came and we recorded an episode and I had my fit picked out to wear and I literally had to bring a change of clothes because I was like, I know this is going to be too hot to it's sit and record so in. hot. And I'm thinking I might have done that. I might have should have done that today. It's not too go, bad. You've got a layer situation. Yeah. You could go, you strip, could go strip off that turtleneck. <laughs> I might have to take a break halfway through. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. The chains are staying on, though. I was going to say. I'll my chains today. The chains are, uh, <laughs> the chains are hot. These chains, worth nothing, but um, they look nice. They look really good. <laughs> they look really so good. not my clout. <laughs> <laughs> so, Grace. So, Linnea. What are we talking about on this fine Sunday morning that will air on Wednesday morning? Yeah. Today, we're going to do a kind of obscure Heritage Minute. Do you remember the Paul Emil Bourdois Heritage Minute? What did he do? So he was an artist, a Quebec artist, Mm -hmm. and his Heritage Minute is very him in his studio, dressed in all black, black turtleneck, painting and talking. Yes. Talking about the Quebec Quiet Revolution and his philosophies around arts and culture. Which this ties into a little bit of last week's episode, because we do mention the Quiet Revolution in Quebec based on coming off of the, the Rocket Richard riots yeah exactly the Richard riots so there's a thematic transfer into this episode very nice very nice big sad boy vibes oh yes from Paula Mill from what I remember because he speaks to the camera yeah if I recall in the heritage minute yeah yeah it's very break the fourth wall talking to the camera yeah um it was when I went in, I had no idea who this person was. Mm. The only reason I knew that they existed was because of this Heritage Minute. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out he's one of Canada's most significant modern artists. Interesting. Um, but modern art, such sad boy vibes. Big sad boy vibes. Oof. Of like, the, it's not about looking pretty, it's about meaning something. It's about feelings, goddammit. It. It's about feeling, yeah. Produce the art with feeling. Mm. Um, And he is very much that. He is, I think a lot of people would describe him as an abstract painter, but he's uh, an automatiste. That is the the style of painting that he founds. What does that mean? We'll kind of get into how it develops, but it basically comes from the idea that you should paint your subconscious. And so you basically zone out staring at your canvas or whatever you're painting. And then you just like paint without... With feeling. With feeling. But this time with feeling. But this time with feeling. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And so he develops this field of art and then that becomes also a philosophy on arts and culture and society. And so he's uh, kind of... I wouldn't say he's like a communist. He <laughs> does write communist certain things. And he's Quebecois. He's I'm Quebecois. Assuming, yeah. Um, and yeah, and it's kind of actually about how he's rejected by Quebec for a long time as well, which they kind of bring him back into the fold after his death, of course, uh, of course. As, as these things go. It's like, Naturally. oh, now that that guy's dead, I think he had some good ideas. I think, uh, um, I think his art could be sold for a lot of money. Yeah, so now he's celebrated pretty widely in Quebec, though, for That's a long cool. time. He was kind of rejected. Oh, well, what a what a sad boy story. Live and you learn. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the, the life and times of Paul Emile Bourdois. And I 
sure hope I'm pronouncing his name right. <laughs> Paul Emil? Paul Emil Bourdois. Okay. But Paul. Paul, Paul. for short? Yeah. Okay. We can call him Paul. Okay. P E. P E B. Peb. Peb. Peb was born on November 1st, 1905, in St. Hilaire, uh, Quebec, which is a small village about 50 kilometers from Montreal. Today okay. it would be, I think, part of the larger suburbs of Montreal, right. but it's off island kind of small oh. village at this point. He was the fourth in a family of seven, so a very small Quebec family. Yeah. <laughs> he attended... Tiny. Tiny for their standards. Yeah. It's like, really, you should consider having more kids. <laughs> Such a middle child, though. I yeah. I feel like that the adds to child. the sad boy vibes. <laughs> he was never thought of. Yeah. <laughs> he attended a public school from ages five to 12 and then was privately instructed by some residents of the village, which I love. It's not even... He's like, did you go to a private school? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was instructed by residents of the village. It takes a village. <laughs> the village people were his <laughs> teachers. <laughs> From an early age, Paul was artistically inclined. His earliest creations were works of bricolage, which is French for DIY, DIY or do-it-yourself. <laughs> okay. DIY. <laughs> DIY. <laughs> DIY. <laughs> and so they're multimedia pieces, like you would do arts and crafts in school. Like okay. We're going to cut out this thing and glue it on this thing. And put some macaroni on there. That's some bricolage right there. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. it's like, oh, what a great macaroni portrait. No, Mom, it's bricolage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like this guy already. Don't you know? <laughs> I use spaghetti and macaroni. It's very multimedia. <laughs> Love that. I just imagine him always dressed. <laughs> And black. Like he was in that video. <laughs> yeah. I, one of my favorite things. So in high school, me and my best friend at uh, Sydney Academy and now Natasha. We, hi, Natasha. Hi, Natasha. We, we would debate together and our debate coach was. Yes, Grace is actually a big nerd. Oh. If you weren't aware. <laughs> if you didn't know already. Yeah, I was a huge. I was captain of our debate team. Um, uh, we And she's proud of it, folks. Proud of it. I also kind of like self-named myself captain because we didn't have that <laughs> official thing. But it was like I went on all the trips. So I guess I'm captain. <laughs> I love that. But our coach was our vice principal. He still is vice principal at Sydney Academy. I think he's almost 80 now. Oh he, he must be almost 80. God. Um, but Natasha told him that when she thinks about, like when he would tell us stories about when he was a kid, <laughs> she's like, when I think about you in the past, I think about your head like <laughs> as it is now. On a smaller version of your body, <laughs> so like a bobblehead, and then everything's black and white. That's how I envision Paul during these times. So yeah. it's like him basically fully bald, except for that like that ring yeah. of hair that he has. Yeah. And then the black getup, but like a big head. Yeah. Like when uh, they do cartoon characters, like cartoon characters that wear the same outfit every day, and they mm -hmm. do them when they're little. Like when they did the Rugrats and they were little, it was like just them, <laughs> but like much minier. Much minier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I think. What was that show? It was. Uh, oh, um, Anaconda. Angela, Anaconda. Angela Anaconda. That is what I am picturing That's for Paul so the fun. <laughs> That's a great Canadian show. Is that Canadian? I believe so, yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, no way would an American network put that out. That show is so weird. I'm going to confirm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Canadian. Is it French? No. Couldn't be. No. Started in 1999. Only lasted till 2001, so. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Didn't have a long a weird run. show. But it was on, I remember, like. Funny. Just reruns. Anyways. So. I am now picturing PB, no, what was it? Peb. Peb. I'm now picturing Peb as uh, <laughs> I love Angela it. Anaconda. I'm so just going to call him Peb this whole time. I love it. <laughs> I'm into it. So in 1922, at the age of 16, Peb had the good fortune of meeting the local painter, Ozias Leduc. That's o a name. Ozias? I know. Ozias. That's got to come back. Ozias was one of Quebec's first painters, producing many portraits, still lifes, and landscapes, as well as religious works. Ozias was mainly mm. self-taught and had worked on many different projects through his long and illustrious career, including the painting of the interior of churches. That's mm. what he kind of becomes known for, is decorating churches. That's mm. cool. Very Sistine Chapel. Yeah. Which... I wouldn't consider that a career, but I guess when there's enough churches. Hey, they're in Quebec. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Every nook and cranny yeah. must be adorned. <laughs> 
<laughs> and there's churches on every street corner. Yeah. <laughs> so. And by the time that Ozias met Peb, he was in his late 50s and willing to take on an apprentice. He took on the young man to decorate churches with him, notably the Pauline Chapel of St. Michel Cathedral in the Diocese of Sherbrooke, the Chapel of the Sisters of Sacred Heart in Halifax, and the Baptistry of Notre Dame Church in Montreal. Very cool. So he gets to go on field trips with Ozias, and he's painting churches. That's cool. Also very, like... (laughs) <laughs> Peb coming home and he's just like mom this old man wants to take me to Halifax and we're gonna paint churches <laughs> she's like that sounds amazing <laughs> that sounds what so an great. amazing opportunity what's his name honey oh Zias. Zias. <laughs> oh he's a good guy <laughs> <laughs> the wizard of Oz <laughs> yeah right <laughs> that's who it is Peb and the wizard of Oz <laughs> Peb is Dorothy <laughs> <laughs> there's no place like home yeah, there's no place like home uh, now I'm picturing him in the dress right <laughs> the with the shoes <laughs> oh Zias is a name ugh, I've never heard that before but that's no. like there was a there was an older gentleman who grew up like around Lunenburg or whatever and his name was Aloysius Aloysius which I thought was Ooh. such a cool name yeah. and people called him Wish which I thought was cute that's, yeah I think that's how you have to but uh maybe but, Al well yeah but yeah my mom was like yeah that was like a that's like a name. That's like a real name. Aloysius. There's a, for some reason that makes me think of a cat. And I feel like there's a cat, maybe an Aristocats that's named Aloysius. Oh, maybe. Let I us know, know in the comments. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> let us know if you are slash no an Aloysius. If your name is Aloysius. Yeah. You're awesome. There's a great book by Canadian author Michael Crummy that also has an, an Aloysius. Aloysius in it. Mm. Yeah. Aloysius, Jeremiah, Jebediah. 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 These are names that need to be, they need comebacks. I don't know if Jebediah <laughs> needs to come back, but, you know, if your name's Jebediah, that's cool. That's but. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Ozias encouraged Paul to seek out further formal training. He secured Peb, sorry, not Paul. Peb. Oh, God. Uh, I was like, who are you talking about? Who? Who's Paul? <laughs> he secured Peb a scholarship to study at the newly opened Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Montreal. Very cool. So in 1925, Emmanuel Forgerat, the school's first director, had been replaced by Charles Maillard, who, along with Robert Ma- Robert Myas and Edmund Dionette, this is a lot of French names, folks. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really trying to roll with the punches. The province of Quebec. <laughs> uh, were Peb's teachers. So okay. these are pretty well-known artists in the Quebec. I'm scene. sure they were. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Peb did not enjoy his years that he spent at the School of Fine mm-hmm. Arts. Back to that decollage or whatever. Yeah, bricolage. Bricolage. <laughs> Deco- what's decollage? Decollage is like a woman's oh, like, yeah. um, upper yeah. chest. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure he's into that, too. <laughs> but, uh, yes, yeah, like, bricolage. Yeah, I've really branched out from bricolage to decollage, <laughs> if you know what I mean. His and the girls just like, walk away. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. So the kind of training he had received from Le Duc, or Ozias, so he respectively always refers to him as Monsieur Le Duc. Le Duc. Never calls him Ozias. Not Bulldog? <laughs> Le Duc. No, not Bulldog, unfortunately. Imagine her trying to teach at a fine arts school. <laughs> She's like, I don't know how to read music. Yeah. Um, She'd be like Mary, not Mary Poppins, but more like uh, Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music. She'd yeah. be like Maria. She'd be like, let's go on an adventure. Did you know the, that the hills are just so alive? <laughs> With the sound. No, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Minute women do karaoke. <laughs> the new segment. Um, so that one-on-one training that he had grown accustomed to was more to his liking and then moreover he quarreled a lot with the new director of the school Maillard who was a painter in a very academic tradition and taught his students to value regionalism and to despise modern art interesting so very traditional and and for Quebec as we kind of talked about in the last episode a lot of Quebec culture at this time is about retention and preservation rather right. than innovation so what year is this we didn't talk about what year he was born so he's born in 1922 oh so, okay or sorry not 1922 he was born in 1905 so okay. around now he's like in, in 1925 is is when he's like studying at okay this fine arts school. so he's like 20 yeah yeah all right cool a young man who is combative with the the 
authorities of this school. Sounds like most young men I know. Yeah, especially ones that start with bricolage. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So Peb completed his studies in 1927, graduating from it with a first diploma. So he did very well in his studies, despite this these issues despite his problem with the man yeah five years later he was awarded the teaching diploma that qualified him to give drawing lessons though it appears he was teaching as early as 1927 okay. so whatever just like didn't have a diploma um yeah when he was hired by the montreal catholic school board as a high school art teacher right Peb's time as an art teacher ended when Maillard, the director with whom he fought at his school, uh-huh. arranged to have another artist take over Peb's job, despite Peb ha- having already agreed and being hired for the position. Okay. So he was hired, and then the director was like, actually, I've got somebody better to fill the role. And the yeah. school was like, okay, you're fired, and we're hiring this new guy. Ugh, okay, that's mean. <sighs> yeah, that's... Anyways... Peb decided that instead of fighting for the job, he would continue his studies and he left for Paris, okay. as, as Canadian artists do. Good for him. Yeah. Especially French Canadian artists. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Though, through the generous support of Abbe Olivier Moreau, a friend That's of a his name. teacher, a friend of Osias. Yeah. Abbe Olivier. <laughs> At the time, um, and at the time, the curé of the pasture parish of Notre Dame in Montreal. So, He's friends with Ozias, and Ozias painted the church that the abbe works at. Mm-hmm. And so the abbe is going to help Peb. And okay. he gives him money so Peb can live in Paris. Um, and he lives there from the end of 1928 till 1930. Nice. So he's essentially being sponsored. Okay. He enrolled in the Artile de Art Sacré, which was under the direction of Maurice Denis and Georges de Vallier. During his stay in Paris, Peb kept a diary in which he made notes about the courses he took, the exhibitions that he would visit, which were like Renoir and Picasso and all of these people that are uh, contemporaries of him at this point, like they're still alive and painting, Okay, and his travels in France. From his diary, it seems that he preferred one-on-one training still. So he was in the field with someone named Pierre Dubois um, rather than training in the classroom. Right. Uh, Given Peb's background, Dubois invited him to join him on a project with the Department of Meuse, so that's like a province in France, where he was working on church decorations. So they're still painting churches. Mm -hmm. It's like, you've been doing that since you were 16. You want to come with me? And he's like, absolutely. like, sure thing. (laughs) See you later. Peb was more than willing to leave the stuffy classroom behind and go to a not so stuffy church, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I just think it's funny that the one I was the source I was reading is like he left the stuffy classroom behind. It's like, yeah, and he went to a church. Yeah. <laughs> which would probably be more restrictive. Right. But anyways, that was He gets to paint. He gets, he to, gets paint. to do his thing. Yeah. It was on this project that Peb met uh Marie Alain Cortier, who is a man. Oh. His name is Marie. <laughs> I was like, when I first read it, I was like, ooh, yeah. a French lady. That's what I just did Man. as well. Okay. <laughs> he was a Dominican right. priest. A um, Dominican priest? It does not mean he's from the Dominican. Oh, okay. It's like a cool. order of priests. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Though he didn't know it then, Cortier would become the editor of the Paris Review L'Art Sacré and an advocate for reproachment between the Roman Catholic Church and modern artists. Oh. So this is an early connection for him um, that right. will be important later on. Okay. This initial contact with... I'll uh, keep Marie in mind. <laughs> keep Marie in mind. <laughs> this initial contact between the two would become crucial for Peb later on. Okay. He discovered the École de Paris and was especially excited by the work of Pasquin and Renoir, So, in other words, modern art was more widely accepted here in Paris than it was back in Montreal. And so this period of time really opens his eyes to the opportunities, the possibilities Mm -hmm, of modern art. But Peb did not see himself following the footsteps of modern and impressionistic painters. On the contrary, when he returned to Canada in June 1930, Peb expected that he would make a career like his his uh, instructor, Ozias, as a church decorator. Okay. So he's, I think he enjoys it. I think he likes that they're big projects. Right. And they probably bring in a fair amount of money. Right. Um, But that's what he thinks he's going to do for the rest of his life. Okay. 
the, in the autumn of that year, Ozias took him on an associate, took him on as an associate to decorate the church of the parish of St. Uh, Agnes in Lachlan. Okay. Somewhere in Quebec. Thereafter, Peb tried to make his way as an independent decorator, but his efforts to obtain commissions in his own name for various Montreal churches, um, including St. Denis, St. Jean de Croix, and St. Vincent Ferrier, proved unsuccessful. Why? So part of it is the Great Depression. So the Ugh, Great Depression hits. That thing. <laughs> Popping up a lot yeah. in Canadian history. So there's not as much money going around for artists, and that was combined with his lesser reputation. Right. So if someone like Ozias is available, then you're probably going to hire him if you don't have the money to hire two artists or, you know. Yeah. The fewer projects are going to the people with more established reputations. Okay. His only commission was the Stations of the Cross, incidentally quite similar to one that he had painted with, Ozias in the St. Hilaire Church, so back in his hometown, right. um, which was purchased by the Church of St. Michel in, uh, in a parish in Rougemont okay. in Quebec. Peb grew increasingly bitter over his lack of work and later on would trace his fallout with the Christian faith to these moments, which is a weird relationship to have with God. <laughs> yep. The whole point is like, not that you can believe whatever you want. I'm not saying that I am a particularly Christian person. But I think the whole point is that God is supposed to, like, test you with these moments. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> I really wanted to paint churches and God wouldn't tell his <laughs> other people to give me money to paint the churches. So I'm done. So I'm done. <laughs> I have a very financial relationship with God. I'm over it. <laughs> Hardship? I'm a middle child. <laughs> I'm sick of this shit. He gave me frankincense. Mur, but all I wanted was that gold. Yeah. And he's not giving it to me. Yeah. <laughs> so because there were virtually no other options, he fell back on teaching as a drawing master at the Collage André Grasset and in schools of the Montreal Catholic School Commission. Okay. So now he's bouncing around schools teaching art. I feel like he hates that. Yeah, I, I think that... It's funny, because it's not like he is really wants to produce crazy meaningful art at this point in his right. career like he's not trying to break the system by any means but he really right. doesn't want to teach <laughs> right which i think is probably one of those things that some people look at teaching as you know it, it's because you can't do it so you have to teach it yeah <laughs> so i think it's probably i feel like it's that okay. mentality an extremely heavy teaching load prevented him from doing much of his own work more up, moreover, dissatisfied with the number of his paintings, he destroyed many of the canvases and painted over them. Oh, God. So a lot of the art from this period is lost from his collection. But okay, maybe it was bad. <laughs> maybe it actually just was bad. Yeah. It was really cool. The uh, There was a library that, or an art gallery that was doing x-rays of da vinci paintings i uh-huh. think to reveal what he had painted over because a lot of artists do that yeah. like they'll paint over whatever just especially like, then when you only had so many canvases yeah mm-hmm. i mean canvas is expensive today but then yeah. i imagine it's really expensive yeah and hard to come by yeah and especially if you were doing it for commission and they're like mm-hmm. i don't like it yeah. you just have to paint over it and do it again yeah. so <laughs> on june 11th but what did they find Oh, it, just like previous paintings. That's cool. I, I don't know any that come to mind. Okay. <laughs> I know it was also really big for Vincent van Gogh because he was quite poor. So he and would paint crazy? over. Yeah. And, you know, crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> Here's my ear. <laughs> yeah. Everyone should watch. Um, oh, what's the name of it? One second. I have a movie recommendation. Oh, no way. Is, is the world ending? Yes. It might be. Um, it might be. Given that I'm the loving Vincent, that's the name of the movie. Oh yeah, that came out fairly recently. Yeah, it was like 2018, 2017. Yeah, but every still of the film is a painting, like a real painting. That's so cool. And so it's a bunch of artists who learned to paint in Vincent Van Gogh's style, and it's a fictional story. But all of the characters in it are either real people or based off of people he painted. So the so main neat. character is not a real person, but it's like the postmaster's son, and he's based off a painting That's so cool. that Vincent Van Gogh did. It's such an amazing movie. It's basically the postmaster's son trying to figure out what happened to Van Gogh in his final days. Uh-huh. Such a good movie. 
Oh, um, I haven't seen it. That the Irish artist who or the Irish actress who is in Little Women. Oh, she's Saoirse in it. Ronan. Yes, I don't know yeah. how to pronounce her name. <laughs> Saoirse Ronan. She's yeah. in it. Um, and I, no, not Willem Dafoe. He's in the other Van Gogh movie. Yeah. But yeah, excellent movie. Awesome. Highly recommend. I love her too. She's so great. Yeah. Yeah. So on June 11th, 1935, Peb got married. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She kind of comes out of, out of nowhere. Gabrielle Goyette. Um, she was the daughter of a doctor. So okay. fairly well off. Um, they would go on to have three children. Hmm. Doesn't seem like she's like a huge part of his life though. Okay. Uh, he's not like painting her or his family or anything like that. And okay. it seems it was a very quiet relationship. <laughs> okay. Two years later, he was finally appointed professor of drawing and decorations at a school. So oh. now he has a permanent teaching position. So, you know, things are getting a little better. Right. He had an annual sal- salary of $1,200, <laughs> which I feel like at the time that was okay. It was all right. I think we're still in the Depression, so you're probably yeah. just happy to have a job. Yeah. And he was teaching at Ecole de Meuble in Montreal. Okay. Unlike his previous experience with teaching, Peb actually really liked this job. He found it really stimulating, fulfilling, and this was largely due to the presence of like-minded colleagues and bright-minded students. I also think he's teaching adults now. Okay. Um, Not to say that, like, high school students aren't considered adults during this time, but I do think this is, like, college level, not, not high school students. Peb enjoyed the discussions, particularly with the architecture teacher and the art history teacher. Mm -hmm. Uh, Furthermore, Peb was reunited with Coutier. So that was the Marie guy that he met in France. Yeah. (laughs) He had crossed the Atlantic to preach for a church in New York. But when he comes over, as a result of World War II, he can't go home. Um. So, So this is a few years into his gig. At this school. We're now in the 40s. Okay. And he came to America to, to preach. And then I believe the fall of France takes place while he's out of the country. God. And he can't come back. God. So he just has to stay in North America. Um, and he winds up visiting Montreal. And then he would semi-regularly lecture at the school that Peb That's taught cool. at. Yeah. And he's like, yo, Peb. And he's, he's like, like, yo, yo. Marie. <laughs> We back. (laughs) It's been a long time, buddy. (laughs) Stylistically, this is also when Peb's career really transforms. Okay. So in the late 1930s, he discovered surrealism. Okay. Which, like, Salvador Dali. I was just going to say, are we talking like melting clocks? Yeah. Yeah, that's like, I feel like, yeah, yeah, it's trying to paint things that, like, aren't real but are real in a different plane of existence (sighs) oh my god art oh my god it's so crazy (laughs) it's such a crazy thing it's so hard to do visual artists in this format because you have to describe what their art looks like rather than just showing it it's very true everyone should go google peb and look at his art from different times um i believe the art gallery of canada and don't just Google Peb. <laughs> Don't just Google because Peb. Because I won't come up. That's true. Uh, Paul Emile Bourdois is who you should be looking at. Actually, up. Peb is the French school in Yarmouth. That's par en bas. So, it's, so everybody calls it Peb. Peb. There you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some really good digital collections of his work. So oh, you cool. should flip through, kind of look at that. You might get a better sense for what we're talking about. For what the boy is all about. Yeah, what he's into. Yeah, he's definitely into things that are not things. Mm. <laughs> They're very abstract <laughs> images. Yeah. <laughs> Peb began reading works of Andre Breton. Uh, so he's a French art critic okay. who quoted and promoted an old technique of Da Vinci. So Da Vinci encouraged his pupils to stare at their art surfaces blankly to find unique patterns that they could use as guides for original paintings. So maybe it's a crack in the wall that you can use. Or maybe okay. it's something like uh, there's bumps in the texture of the canvas, something like that. And right. then you can invent a scene. You don't need a reference Okay. based off of that. That's cool. These patterns were the artist's subconscious at play. Okay. So it's your, your brain coming up with a picture. Pep concluded that the painting support, whether that's paper or canvas or whatever, whatever medium you're using. Yeah 
could be regarded as a kind of panoramic screen on which from the artist's subconscious could be projected. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. Okay. (laughs) What I'm saying is I don't know. Art is deep. But art is deep. And so he is, he's like, if you look at something long enough and you zone out enough, your subconscious, you can visualize your subconscious. Like and a you can projector. Paint, like a projector on this Like this it's screen. just there. Like it's yeah. already there. It's already there. You just need to you just need to let go enough to see it. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> Red pill or blue pill. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm gonna give this a try. <laughs> All that remained to be done was to distinguish formal patterns, make them more precise, and add color and shade to create an effective volume. So at that point it's just it, now you just have to carve it out. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking about that with like a hunk of like clay, like sculptors. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I was trying to think who it was. There was a, a sculptor who was very adamant that the the rock will tell you what it wants to be kind of thing. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know. Deep. There's a sculptor who takes like marble and then sculpts things that look soft with it, like pillows and stuff. That's cool. It's also really mean. You can yeah. really prank somebody with that. Because they look soft. Yeah, they, they look, look plush. Cushy. Yeah. <laughs> so I would take a nap on that. Concussion. <laughs> dazed. Dazed. <laughs> and You're just confused. Dazed. <laughs> You're just dazed. Don't worry. Pev painted a series of paintings of gouache. So gouache is, you take, I believe, oil paints, and you add stuff to make it even thicker. So rather than adding a solvent to dissolve it and make it more usable, you make it thicker. Thick. Thick. Gouache. Okay. Gouache. 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 Oh, right. He uses optimism <laughs> as his style. On the initiative of Father Wilfred Corbet, who was always very open-minded with regard to Canadian modern art, the painting was the paintings were shown for the first time in the parlors of the Seminar de Joy, uh, Joliet from the 11th to 14th of January 1942. So this is like an art club oh so it's basically. like shown like the paintings are shown yeah they're on exhibition his gouache his gouache gouache his gouache paintings okay <laughs> make it as nova scotian as possible his right. gouache paintings <laughs> he's so fun <laughs> <laughs> that spring peb exhibited a total of uh 45 gouaches in the salle de That's a lot of paint L'Armitage. i know i wonder how big they are what if they tiny what if they're just like a postcard we, I was talking about this the other day. So there's a, a Halifax art gallery that does um, tiny paintings. Oh, that's like you cool. can submit tiny paintings to it. I want to do it next year. But it's just four by four canvases that oh, you then so cool. photograph and then you submit to the art gallery that's and they display so cool. them. They sell them for like a hundred and fifty dollars, apparently. That's so cool. Yeah, and they're just a bunch of like local artists. And then you make fifty percent commission if your painting gets sold. That's awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. That's pretty freaking cool. I think the submissions just closed, but I want to do it next year. Yeah. Yeah. Where Where is this gallery? I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll, okay. We'll Google it. We'll, maybe we'll post it yeah, on we can Google social medias. So during this time, his art pieces are, um, they're advertised as surrealist works. Mm-hmm. So later on, they'll be more advertised as automatist works, but that's not a word yet for everybody else. I feel like that's also probably a, under the umbrella of surrealism. Yeah, yeah, it kind of falls into that. Yeah, umbrella. You're mm-hmm. right. That's a good word. Yeah. It. Umbrella is a great word. It's a fun word. So uh, the show is a pretty critical and financial success. Like, it goes over very well, even though it's kind of radical okay. art for the time. The following year, Peb moved from gouaches to oils and shifted his attention from a contrast between drawing and color to a tension between objects in the foreground and an infinite background. Infinite, eh? Infinite background. Okay, that's very Salvador Dali. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, his, like, 
early art pieces are like is far more colorful. Mm. As he goes through, there's way less color in the paintings. It becomes very white and black. Interesting. Yeah. These exhibits in the fall. He got cheap. He didn't want to buy all those colors. Yes. <laughs> it's like I want to buy two colors. Please. Just two, Thank please. You very much. Just two. <laughs> They're like you can do a lot with red, yellow, and blue. He's like no. just two. No, <laughs> just two. Just black I'm a sad black. boy. No. <laughs> How will Grace be able to Photoshop my bossy into my colored paintings? <laughs> she can only Photoshop in black and white. <laughs> Oh, oh God. God. It's so <laughs> <laughs> this is so stupid. I'm so sweaty. I'm <laughs> so no warm. It's so warm in here. Okay. Whew. Uh, I just keep <laughs> looking out at the ocean and I'm like, oh, it looks so cold. Let me drown in yeah. it. <laughs> just for a minute. So his new oil paintings are exhibited in the fall of 1943, but these were not greeted by collectors with the same enthusiasm as the previous ones. Interesting. Okay. You know, people people want the, more of the same, and he's like, no, I'm going to give you something different. It's going to be exciting. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> so Peb was blazing a new path, distinguishing himself from all of his contemporaries. He cultivated a new art community from his pupils and their friends at the School of Fine Arts in Montreal, or Musée de Beaux-Arts, or École de Beaux-Arts, and the College of Notre Dame. Some of these people created the Groupe Automatiste, which was then was Peb is seen as the founder of that. Ooh. So like Group Seven. Like, da, 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 I was just gonna say, we have Group Automatiste. We love to do Canada. groups. Artists yeah. love to do groups. We love groups. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to paint alone. <laughs> I need a group. <laughs> Oui, mon amis. <laughs> Mes amis. <laughs> French. <laughs> in 1946 and 1947, Bordeaux, uh, not Bordeaux, Peb. Peb. I, I don't want to call him Bordeaux. Don't do it. His name is Peb. Don't fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't you fucking do it. Peb. Peb? I was like, who's Bordeaux? <laughs> <laughs> Peb and the group Automatiste held exhibitions in a series of makeshift galleries in Montreal and Paris. Okay. So they're now displaying across the ocean. Wow. <laughs> the activity of... The Atlantic can't stop us. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can stand between us and showing our art in another French city. Not even an ocean, baby. <laughs> God forbid they showed it in, like, an English city. No. We can't let them know what's happening. Right. <laughs> The activity of Peb as an automatist culminated at the Librairie Tranquille in uh, Montreal on the 9th of August, 1948, with the launching of a collection of texts entitled Refuse Global. So this is referenced in the minute. Um, so Refuse Global, so like refusing the world? So yes, refuse as in refuse, like refusal. Yeah. So it's global refusal in English. So this is a pretty okay. controversial work. I don't know if it's controversial. Mm. It's very radical for the time. Mm. Um, and it includes a lot of things. So it includes some dramatic pieces. It includes a lecture. Uh, also just an article. I love when art is words. But it's mostly remembered because Peb includes his manifesto in it. Oh my God. Yeah. Peb has a manifesto. He has a whole damn manifesto. Stop. <laughs> Okay, so this might be a stupid question. Does a manifesto have to, like, are manifestos always negative? I don't Or do we just hear so. about the negative, like, world-ending ones? Yeah, I, I think, like, it's like a statement of your beliefs. Right. So it's okay, like right, your right, right. motives, your intentions, like, what you intend to do. serial killer who famously had a manifesto? Uh, the guy with the glasses. Uh, the guy with the sunglasses. The Unabomber? The Unabomber. Yeah. yeah he had a freaking wild ride of a manifesto. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to like explain his intentions and why he's bombing a bunch of people. I guess. Okay. But I think it is, I think they get associated so negatively because usually it, mm. like pe- it's that people justifying outwardly yeah. negative actions. Right. And I guess like, time. cause to manifest. And so you're just like, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like expressing that. Yeah, exactly. Expressing those thoughts. So, yeah, that's why you have, like, Carmina's Manifesto. Right. And all these, yeah. Right. But, so this is, like, the Automatiste Manifesto. Okay. And it's countersigned by all the other Automatistes. Oh, cool. Uh, or at his, least some of them. His mon ami. His, his friends. Mes amis. Yeah, mes amis. On <laughs> <A> Manifesto. 
I hate myself. I don't. I love I myself. I love you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 2021 is all about positive self-love. Positive self. Positive narcissism. Positive narcissism. Yeah. I love myself. I love myself. <laughs> Grace looks. Also, Grace looks great today. As we oh, already thanks. mentioned, BNB fits. Um, Grace is rocking a cute little fit. I don't know how she's not sweating profusely, though. Like, I don't know how you're... I mean, she is right here. I can talk to the real Grace. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know how you're it's, Oh, but you got your warm. cute little scrunchie. I got my scrunchie that Linnea made for me as part of my Christmas gift. Yeah. It matches my socks. It does. It's, it's very cute. It's yellow. It's my favorite color. Actually, in the photo that we took for your BNB fit, you can see... I don't know if you're going to use them with your hair up. Oh no, it's on your wrist because you can see wrist, the, yeah. the you can see the top of your socks, so it's like very yes. cute. Yeah, you'll you'll see the tie in. You'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, with the gold chains. Yeah, She's by that chain gang. <laughs> yeah, Linnea had her. She was like Sporty Spice today. She had her. Yeah, Panagonia. Yeah, look, Patagucci. On. You know, Patagucci, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah. Everybody has to go follow B and V Fits on yes. Instagram. The Patagucci to see what we're talking about. is not on now because it is. Hot. <laughs> it, yeah, that had to be removed. That's a fluffy sweater. That was warm. <laughs> In his manifesto, he denounced the old ideology of preservation. The Quebec culture was something that needed to be preserved through language and tradition and especially the church. Mm. Quote, to hell with holy water, sprinklers, and the toque. And the toque. The toque? Yeah, he's like, get it out. He's anti-toque. As in hats? As in hats. He doesn't like toques? Nope, he's out. He's like, get him out. But, like, what about that quadruple-rolled hipster beanie look? <laughs> Add a roll to my beanie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's like, that's not Quebec culture. Huh. Quebec culture is more than Christianity and toques. Uh, that's just such a stark choice of two things I know, yeah. to be down with. <laughs> um, I can just, that's just a broad... It's interesting. The Pope, when he visits Montreal. <laughs> Always. Yeah. He's like, gotta fit in with that Montreal culture. The Pope Duke. Uh, okay. Peb thundered in the middle of the manifesto, which called for an opening of Quebec culture to the liveliest manifestations of universal thought. Quote, we foresee a future in which man is freed from the useless chains to realize a plentitude of individual gifts. A plentitude. A plentitude. I love that. In necessary unpredictability, spontaneity, and resplented anarchy. Until then, without surrender or rest, in community of feeling with those who thirst for a better life, without fear of setbacks in encouragement or persecution, we shall pursue in joy our overwhelming need for liberation, bludgeoning the present and the future to death with the past is finished. Woof. Yeah. Um, I love the thirst for a better life. Like thirst for thirsty. a better life. <laughs> yeah, I thirsty. love that. Yeah, it's, uh, and mind you, this is all a translation. It would have been written in French oh, uh, yes. originally. But whoever did the translation did a very good job of kind of capturing. Chose some good words, words. I think. Love it. The manifesto caused an uproar in the press. Some hundred articles, almost all of them negative, came out immediately after it was launched. Yep. Its open attack against Catholicism and the right-wing nationalism symbolized by the Union Nationale cost Peb his job at uh, Ecole de Meuble. So he's out of his job. Well, don't talk shit about the Pope. <sighs> yeah. Dude. In Quebec, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The painter, who always regarded his dismissal as a grave injustice since it was the result of extracurricular activity, um, and there had been no complaints about his teaching. So he's totally pissed and never forgives the school for dismissing okay. him. Okay. Which, granted, but that is one of those things that I think people misconstrue what freedom of speech means. Yeah. Like, freedom of speech means the government can't persecute you for what you say. Yeah, you can still be persecuted. But you, you can still be disliked. A private organization yeah. can do whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, not to say that I agree with his dismissal, but no. whatever. Several members of the group Automatiste defended Peb in the press, but their efforts were in vain. Henceforth, he had to live by painting alone. So his only mm -hmm. income is now going to come from whatever he can get in commissions, which is right. a hard life. Like, right. Yeah. In 1949, he recalled the inst incident in an autobiographical pamphlet um, in which he wrote, at last, to, at last free to paint. So, like, he's excited. 
right. that he gets to finally paint. But in reality, his dismissal from the school made things really difficult for him and his family. Mm-hmm. And in 1951, his wife and children end up leaving him. Oh. Um, yeah, which really crushed him. Like he's That's like, really sad. All I all I have is painting now. Which That's yeah. hard. In 1952, that doesn't make you a sad boy. I don't know what does. Yeah, big sad boy vibes. Yeah. <laughs> in 1952, he sold his house on the banks of the Richelieu River um, to a doctor, uh, Doctor Alphonse Campo. Just another good name that needs to be included. <laughs> yeah, Alphonse. no reason other than Alphonse Campo <laughs> is a is a sick name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who then actually went on to take care of the house really well. Like it was noted that he was very cautious of taking care of this home which was a pretty old home and right. it stood like into the it still stands the oh, present cool. day like you could see the house That's but i think cool. it's privately owned but you could trespass whatever do whatever you want do what you want to do <laughs> despite early denouncements the manifesto marked the beginning of a profound social change in quebec and signaled the dawn of the quebec Revo- quiet revolution so okay. this is like the real roots of it is right. groups of artists who are really concerned with the socio-political and socio-cultural state of Quebec. Okay. So the Quiet Revolution is characterized by effective secularization of the government, so really separating it from church and state. Okay. Which doesn't really exist in Quebec at this time. Not at all. As you can tell, his whole career has been dictated by priests basically yeah. giving him ins yeah. in places. Uh, it's also characterized by the creation of a state-run uh, welfare state, and the realignment of politics into federalists and sovereignists or separatist factions, mm-hmm. and the okay. eventual election of a pro-sovereignty provincial government in the 1976 election. Okay. So we're getting to, like, separate Quebec separatists right. people. Yeah. But Peb doesn't really stay in Quebec to see all this happen. So he's excommunicated from the Quebec art scene. He has no friends in the city anymore. So he decides he's going to move to New York. No more friends. No more friends. Well, and any of his friends are like, we can't super associate with you because we will also get exiled. Yeah. So he decides that he's going to move to New York. However, this is the height of McCarthyism and immigration authorities made it really difficult for him to move there. Okay. So artists for one, are pegged as communists all the time, even if they right. aren't communists. Like, I don't think he's a communist necessarily. Yeah. Um, but in 1947, he had done an interview with the Montreal communist periodical Combat. And at the time, a few members of the group Automatist had made overtures to the communist Labour Progressive Party, mm-hmm. but their anarchism was well-suited to the party's revolutionary discipline, and there was no agreement about the kind of art that could be reached amongst these people. So okay. they're in conversation with... Con- I, they view themselves as anarchists. Right. But they are not... But they're they in conversation with communists. Yeah. And basically his association means that the FBI was like, don't let him immigrate here. Oh, God. So he's having a lot of trouble at the border. Yeah. <laughs> is basically what's happening. Like the Surrealists in France, the Quebec automatists were seen primarily as rebels rather than true revolutionaries. Okay. In any case, Refuse Global had a paragraph entitled Reglement Final des Camps, which marked the group automatists' definitive break from Canadian communism, but the FBI doesn't really care about that. They're not going to read everything. They're like, you're a communist. <laughs> yeah. Peb challenged his denial to enter the country, and he actually won his case against the FBI. Because he's not a communist. Because he's not a communist. Okay. <laughs> and was finally able to move to the United States, initially to Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he spent the summer of 1953 painting by the seaside. Oh, nice. He may have met Hans Hoffmann at this time, uh, who was a German painter and taught summer courses in Cape Cod, where... There was this artist's colony. Okay. There's there's this group of artists that all go to Cape Cod. It's like summer camp for them. And they have this little art retreat. In the fall, Peb settled in New York, uh, where he remained until September 1955. So he stays there for two years. With the support of several Quebec collectors and two New York galleries, he was able to rent a large studio in Greenwich Village. Nice. This period was extremely important for the development of his art and his career. From then on, Peb used only a palette knife to paint his paintings. No more brushes, just knives. (laughs) Knives only. (laughs) Wow. 
I came with kitchen knives. This guy. <laughs> That's why your mom got you those kitchen knives for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Just for painting. <laughs> Just for painting. <laughs> That bread knife has some texture. <laughs> yeah. My old bread knife just wasn't cutting it yeah. anymore. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pun heavily intended. His first New York exhibition was held at the Pasdua Gallery in January 1954 and attracted favorable notice, but it was not a very prestigious gallery. Okay. Fortunately, his work was then taken up by the Martha Jackson Gallery, which is a prestigious gallery. Cool. While while in New York, Peb wa- had realized that although he could claim to have been inspired by surrealism, especially its concept of art originating in the unconscious or the subconscious, the abstract expressionism practiced by Jackson Pollock, uh, Mark Rothko, artists like this, was going much further in the direction of automatism uh, of the Montreal group. So it's at this point that he realizes that while his roots were in surrealism, he's actually more of an abstract expressionist. Cool. Like Jackson Pollock, who's probably yeah. the most famous American yeah. um, abstract painter. Yeah, very cool. Hoping to receive wider recognition in France than in the United States, Peb set sail on the Liberty on the 21st of September, 1955, with his daughter Janine. So his daughter, he's reunited Aww, with one of his kids. That's nice. Yeah, she, I think she's kind of in her early 20s at this point. That's so she goes with nice. her dad to Paris. That's very cool. However, he did not find the success he had hoped for. Plans to meet with the famous art critic Michel Tapier de Celerin. Why do I gotta have so many names? Yeah. What was the first part? MTC. That's what yeah. we're gonna call him. MTC. Michelle. <laughs> Is he Michelle? That's fine. Yeah. Why can't we all be Madonna's? One name. Leave it there. Peb has a plan to meet Michelle, but it doesn't follow through. Okay. So this famous art critic doesn't wind up meeting with him. Oh, sad. Which is one setback. None of the avant-garde movements in the French capital were really to his taste, so he also doesn't find a community that he super relates to. Okay. That being said, he did have some exhibitions in several important European galleries, such as the Arthur Tooth and Sons Gallery, which we're going to visit if we're ever in London. That does not... Oh, that sounds British. I thought you were saying he was in yeah, France. No. I was like, that does not sound French. That definitely sounds British. <laughs> He's in France, but there right. are several galleries. The Arthur Tooth. Arthur Tooth and Sons Gallery. I love it. <laughs> and he also has his works uh, displayed in a gallery in Dusseldorf, Germany. Dusseldorf, <laughs> Dusseldorf. Love it. I want to go there too. And he did represent Canada at the Universal Exhibition in Brussels. Cool. So kind of like the World Expo. Yeah. He's a Canadian artist that gets displayed there, which is good. So. In, I think in wider Canadian spheres, he's accepted. It's just Quebec that was it's very... It's just Quebec, yeah. Because he is critical of Quebec. Right. Which, you know, you know. someone needed to say someone it. Someone needed it. They needed to be said, you know? Had it not been for the presence of some of his friends in Quebec, his stay in Paris probably would have been a lot harder than it was. Right. His health had never been good. Uh, letters written towards the end of his life reveal that he was very homesick as well. He clearly wants to go back to Montreal, but yeah. he just feels like he can't go back. I think part of it's pride as well. Of he course. just won't go back to Montreal yeah, because naturally. of what they said. As he confessed to his childhood friend, Bernard Bernard. No. This, this episode is full of such stupid names. No. Bernard Bernard. No. Spelled the same? <laughs> yep. No. <laughs> Uh, in no, a letter you. dated on that's a typo st- I hope it's a typo <laughs> I hope it's either me or whatever source I was using for this section that's so funny. typo Bernard because Bernard yeah, Bernard, Bernard. Um, he wrote in a letter that he dreamed of quote building a studio on the banks of the Richelieu at the mouth of the little, little river near St. Matthias oh, that sounds yeah, very nice so he wants to go home yeah However, once settled in Paris, Peb had nevertheless modified his style yet again after a transitional phase that can be seen extending into his New York period in which his paintings became increasingly all over, okay. <laughs> which in in the sense that like you're looking all over the painting. There's no focus oh, point. Oh, right. Okay. Kind of like Pollock's where yeah. you just look all it's over the place. It's a little bit abstract. Yeah. And displayed an ever greater use of white. He began to introduce black shapes into his paintings. <laughs> That's the thing with abstract paintings. Like, he's 
revolutionizing <laughs> painting. Did he you added see a black square. that triangle in the upper right corner? I know. I know. What the fuck? Genius. And I love modern art, and I love the philosophy behind them. Yeah. But I know when people are critical of it, I'm like, I get it. I know it doesn't yeah. sound revolutionary to add a black square to something, but it means a lot but to it's him. it's cool. It's important to him. Yeah. He's a sad boy. Let him have his square. Let him have his black square. I'm the black square. Oh, my God. God. (laughs) Uh. Peb confessed to a Parisian journalist that he was trying to make his paintings reversible so the same work could lend itself successively to two different interpretations. So it could mean one thing but could also mean another, like an inside-out jacket. (laughs) Is that what he said? No. Okay. <laughs> that's that's my interpretation. That's you. Okay. You know, you get those ties, and it can be one way or the other way. Yeah. That's his painting. Reversible? <laughs> Reversible. Okay. <laughs> automatism was then a thing of the past for Peb, so he's not an automatiste anymore. Right. He himself recognized that he had been somewhat influenced by Modrian. His last works were more, like, calligraphy in style. Than okay. actual, they're very white black shapes, that, right. that kind of thing. Right. In their own way, they perhaps were a testimony to the painter's final dream, which he never got to realize, which was ultimately going to Japan. Oh. He really wanted to go to Japan near the end of his life, but he never was That's able to. That's so cool. Yeah. So Paul Emile Bourdois, Peb, died of a heart attack in Paris on the 21st of February, 1960. Oh, Peb. And, yeah, he was pretty young. He was only like 40. Five, I Aww. think. Yeah. In addition, or 55. Math. <laughs> it's hard. Ugh. In addition to his influence on Quebec thought, he left a considerable body of work more significant for its originality and its meaning in the history of Canadian art than the number of paintings. Okay. Two major retrospectives were organized immediately after his death. The first, curated by Willem Sandberg, took place in the Stedelijk. Uh, museum in Amsterdam. You're doing great. You're doing great. Why throw a J in there? The Dutch. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) Um, Which was held in 1961. The second was held in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, or the Musée de Beaux-Arts, on the initiative of its director, Evan Hopkins Turner, which was done in 1962, and thereafter traveled to the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa and the Art Gallery of Toronto. Since the publication of the complete writings of Peb, the originality of his thought is steadily becoming clearer. Every 10 years, there are celebrations commemorating the publication of Refuse Global, which represented a real intellectual upheaval at the dawn of the Quiet Revolution in Quebec. Oh, so that's the life of Peb. <laughs> you know what? I don't hate Peb. I don't either. I think he's like... He's a sad boy. He is a sad boy, but he's not pretentious, I don't no? think. No, I wouldn't say that. He definitely gets in his feels. Yeah, and he has feelings. And I think at the end of his life, it's really all he had in some ways. Yeah. Clearly not a, a super happy person, but yeah. um, don't know if I'd want to grab a beer with him. But No, no, I can't say that he sounds like that type of guy, but uh, I think... I want to quickly be cool to see his painting. Yeah, like to have one of his paintings. I want to quickly show you his his painting because yes, I feel please. like that's a better way of of getting to know him. Everyone, just Google Paul and Millbourdois. You'll see the you'll see the paintings I'm about to show Linnea. But yeah. Oh, is that kind of what you were envisioning? No, no. <laughs> I get the knife thing. <laughs> a lot of holes in the paintings. Interesting. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's very, very cool. It's not, I keep bringing up Pollock, but it's it doesn't look like his works. It's not splatter. No. Oh, he's just kind of a cute little old man. Yeah, always wearing a turtleneck and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, no, these are really cool. Yeah, I think they're cool. I think you can, they still have, uh, I obviously like his these. work is still on display. I think they have them at the Musée de Beaux-Arts. Or maybe that's just a rotational thing. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, you guys should check them out. I'll post some when I uh, when I do a post for this. You guys yeah. will be able to see it. When you're listening to this episode, you'll be able to check it out on the Instagram. Yay. Yay. That was <laughs> a good one. I like that. For being like an obscure one, that was a good one. Yeah, it's a very intense heritage minute. Yeah. And I was like, this dude's going to be so pretentious and unrelatable. But I don't think he is. I think no. he's pretty chill for the yeah. most part. For an abstract artist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
pretty chill. I'm a fan of Pep. <laughs> yeah, and he, he wasn't... I always assume these guys are alcoholics or drug addicts or something. Like They have like that going he on seems in the background. obsessed with his art. Did. Yeah, he just smoked a, a lot of cigarettes. Well... Uh, and that's it. It's very French. <laughs> and he mended relationships with his daughter, so... Yeah, that's cool. and he was really hurt when his like family broke up. It yeah. wasn't like him abandoning the family. Right. I don't know. He seems he seems cool. It's cool. He was just like, I don't think that Catholicism is that great. And everybody got mad. So Well, welcome to Quebec. <laughs> what a legacy. <laughs> what a legacy. Well, thanks for that one. I liked it. No problem. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the Men at Women podcast. If you are not following us on social media already, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, we've just delved into the world of Instagram Reels, and we also are part of the BNV Media BNV Fits page to check out our so fun fun fashion. <laughs> so on Instagram and Facebook, the Minute Women are there at Minute Women Podcast, and then we are on Twitter at the Minute Women. And uh, you can check us out there. And you can also check us out at our website, which is www.minutewomenpodcast.ca. There we have all of our episodes, also including the sources that Grace uses for each episode. So you can fact check, check us out, do your own research on uh, the episodes that we talk about. And once you've done all of that, you can subscribe to Minute Women Podcast on whatever platform you listen to us on. We release new episodes every Wednesday, but you can always turn on your notifications to make sure that you get a notification when the new episode is released. If you are an Apple Podcast user, please give us a rating and a review. That is the best way you can support the Minute Women Podcast right now. We hope to have new ways for you to support us later on in the year, but for now, make sure you review and rate the podcast, and then make sure you share it with all your friends. Word of mouth is the best review. Yes, please. Bye. Bye. Bye.